Sorry. Um, so this session is Lambda Expressions. Um, I was mentioning earlier, it, it's a lot easier to talk about Spirit or the Asynchronous I.O. library because um, those are libraries that I use all the time. Um, Lambda Expressions, I'm feeling even more intimidated because there are people inside this room who work on them um, in the language committee. So there might be issues along the way. I was going to retitle it after Tony's um, session. I was going to title it How I Use Lambda Expressions. Um, and I thought I might get away with that, so if somebody mentions it, they say, well, that, this is how I use them. I have a, a set of standard disclaimers, and um, these have come about over time because um, I usually get critiqued at some point about my slides. It's hard to make slides where you're trying to demonstrate something and also have good code um, in the sense of you're, you're doing things stylistically the way that you want to see them. And so um, you're not going to see a lot of namespace unless it needs to really happen um, in order to get, get an idea of something like function, for example. Many of us probably use boost function. You know, when I'm using standard function, we'll make sure it's a standard function, so something like that. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, this actually, this snippet of code came out of something I was working on at a client's um, code base two weeks ago, and um, how many when you see this immediately want to do something about it? Okay, about half of you. Um, yeah, so it, it kind of rubs you funny because we're doing these while loops of some sort or another and looking at iterators and, um, you know, the first thing you probably want to do is, is something like a for each. Um, and so you start writing your for each and then you realize that you're going to need to somehow create a function for your for each to work upon. Um, and here we're going to go ahead and use um, a functor. And now I have a problem where my functor is going to be somewhere else. But, but I'm somewhat happy with it. Um, it. It's somewhat generic. This is the type of thing that we could argue about on the boost mail list for hours and hours, whether or not um, B and T should be of the same types in order to go ahead and get the product of them. Um, and somebody eventually get beaten down and you change it. Um, but this is, this might be your first step, but then you would, you would write this and you say, boy, I really don't like the fact that the functor is somewhere else and now I'm not sure what's going on. This is gonna be easy, it's got a nice new product. So um, I personally love um, Boost Phoenix. So this is what I would do. I would go ahead and just insert something with Phoenix. I still have some of the same advantages. Um, it's polymorphic. I, I don't know what this thing is and I don't care. It's gonna take care of it when it, when, um, it goes ahead and creates the, um, the function objects for me. And now everything is nice and compact and it's in one spot. But um, that has problems too, right? Phoenix is a library, it's compile time hits, some, um, some places won't let you use it. And most importantly, this is a C++11 talk, and so we're not going to be using Phoenix. We're going to go ahead and use Lambda expressions. All right, and so we have a Lambda expression. Um, probably by this point you've seen several of them already today. All right, let's move on. We've got then our before, and we have our after. And while, um, as we go throughout this, this talk, we're going to find out some other ways that we might want to change our after. Um, it, it's considerably improved. We have something where, I don't know, it's, I, I'm going to have to take some time and think about what's going on versus something that um, it's right in front of me, it's taking up three lines, it's all in the visual part, and I just know what it's going to do. Right. So let's go ahead and compare just for a moment uh, the concept of functors and, and um, the lambda expression that we have. Um, so here at the top, we have this struct called mod. It has a function called operator that takes an int and returns an int. And it goes ahead and takes whatever it's given as its parameter and does a modulus division. Um, we want to keep some state in this thing. And so we store the modulus by passing that in within the constructor. And so this is easy enough to use. We can do a transform passing it in the begins and the ends, and we have what we want to put in 
output, and we can go ahead and construct our functor here, providing the state of what we want. So that's pretty nice. Um, let's take a look now what we've got going on. The lower section we have the lambda function, and or the lambda expression. The lambda expression um, also has very similar bits and pieces. Up here, if you remember, we're going to have and capturing state within the constructor. We're storing that state within the struct. Down below, um, we also somehow are capturing some state. We're utilizing that state then with inside of our, our lambda statement. We have parameters up here inside of our functor, the parameter v, and also with inside of our lambda expression, we also have a parameter. Um, and each of them return something. The, um, the function call operator returns an int, and right here we're, we're returning an int within our lambda function. So there's a lot of similarities between the two, and that's not by mistake. Um, so let's take a look, dive in a little bit further at the different parts that make up the lambda expression. I often wonder if you sit around thinking about um, really cool names that they can name things like you do in a company and then you don't ever show anybody those names later and you have to come up with a generic one. So it's like introducer is what makes it inside of the standard but I always wonder you know, what, what was the name before that somebody typed it down or went in there to change and replace about whatever the cool name was. So um, lambda expressions begin with open and closed brackets. That is how we introduce that we're going to have a lambda expression. Within the lambda expressions introducer, within the square brackets, we're going to have our capture. We have parameters. Um, we have a return type. And then our statement. So these are the main parts. We're going to go through each of these. Between the introducer and the statement, whatever ends up there is the declarator. And it could be a lot of different things, but as we're going to find out here in a moment, it's optional. Um, and so, you now know its name. We're going to use it. The lambda expression, when it's evaluated, <laughs> will become a closure object. So we're going to evaluate this expression. And when the expression's done being evaluated, there's going to be an unnamed object. It's called the closure object. And the closure object behaves just like a function object. So we can think of it as a function object in every other way that we normally would. All right, very simple lambda expression. This expression has our introducer. It becomes a closure object. And now what do we do? So now we have a closure object. And um, I don't know how many of you were like me when you were starting off. But it just drove me nuts when people did stuff like this. So I had to put it on the slide. <laughs> this is going to create the closure object. And then we're going to go ahead and call um, the closure object, just as if we would a functor. And um, I might be slow, that might be what it is, but I remember the first few examples, not of lambdas, but many years ago, things like this that I saw, and I'm kind of like, I don't know what they're doing. This looks really, really odd. And finally I realized, right? So um, we just call it like anything else, right? Like any other functor. We go ahead and make that call. And then uh, we get, ooh, say. <clears throat> we, can, um, we can pass parameters. And, um, we can do things with inside of our statement as we would expect. So here we're now passing in our 7. And of course we get 42 because that's important. We can pass um, parameters by reference. And then um, we can do exactly what you would expect. The parameter being passed by reference. Um, multiply equals 6. Passing in our i. I'm going to print out i, and of course again we get 42 because that is the right answer. 
we can pass them in by const reference if we want. And it will do exactly what we would expect, not work. <laughs> so um, we get assignment of read-only reference. Um, it, I'm excited, by the way, wh whoever was mentioning earlier that Clang will be supporting Lambdas in this next major release. Is that all right? Because I, I normally like to use Clang for my slide outputs because they have nice messages and stuff. Um, so we're going to be looking at GCC output. Um, but how many of you here have used either Boost Lambda or um, Phoenix? Good. Good number of you. Um, if only it would say something like this. I'm just so happy, right? So after scrolling pages and pages and pages and pages and pages, you then get on IRC and you ask somebody, how come this didn't work, right? Um, and so there are a few people in the world who are really good at reading that output and they can tell you immediately why it didn't work. But here, this is great, right? We now have lambdas as a built-in thing and the compiler can tell us exactly what's wrong. Assignment of read-only reference V. I mean, it couldn't be clearer, right? This is wonderful. Okay. So here, um, we're passing in um, J. And um, within it, we're going to go ahead and um, V will then be a local variable with inside the statement. We're going to go ahead and multiply equals, and then we're going to print out within it, and again, do the same thing. The point of this, and, it, and I like to learn things by doing and seeing, and these slides, are, these slides basically follow my natural, I wonder if this works, I wonder if this works. So after reading the standard, you know, pages 5, 1, 2, is that right? 5, 1, 2, uh, a million times, and at some point you want to just, I wonder if this works. Um, and so, you know, do these things just work like you would expect them to work, like normal local variables? Well, sure enough, they do. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and create a local variable, j, name j, value 7. Our lambda starts off. It's going to take two parameters, an int by reference um, called b, and an int named j. Multiply equals. Here we're going to pass in j and six, um, and indeed we're going to get exactly what we want and expect to get because j is not going to affect the um, the namespace of um, it's the right word the closest namespace the scope. Thank you. The scope. Um, so our variables within our parameters aren't, aren't affecting our scope. All right, these two are the same. So uh, parameters are optional. You, you don't actually have to put it in there. And um, with, with the possibility of saying this, and then um, you know, with knowing that there are people in the room who work on this stuff, and then getting all kinds of hard questions later, in human interface designs, if there are lots of ways to do things, we pick one so that there's, it makes it easier. And typing like open, closed parent all the time, it would have been easier to teach this language to someone else later. So they're optional. But they'll get used to it. Be there or not be there. Or we pretty commonly want to capture um, state as we had seen previously. And so um, in, our, in our functor that we had previously, we had this, where, um, where we have a constructor. We're going to capture our state as we create it, and then we can work upon that as it actually gets executed. Um, here, we're going to go ahead and have our capture with inside of the introducer. So, um, it's an optional capture, and there's all kinds of different ways that we can use it. We can capture by all by reference. We can capture <coughs> this. We can capture all by value. We can go ahead and list 
a set of identifiers. And we can do that either by value or we can do that by reference. We can do it combinations of those. We can say we want to capture all by reference except for these particular identifiers we want to capture by value. And then the opposite, we want to capture all default by value except for these particular ones we want to capture by reference. Take a look at a couple of these. So previously, we had total elements in here. Instead, this time, um, we actually have capture all by reference. And so within this scope, and we'll talk about what that means in a little bit, we're going to capture total elements um, as if we had listed it inside of our actual capture. So this is going to capture total elements by reference, and we can go ahead and do our multiply equals, and um, we'll do exactly what we need. Let's take a look at something a little more complicated. All right, I've got this method called fill, and it's going to take a vector of ints by reference and something called done. While we're not done, we're going to go ahead and push back um, the next value of i and then increment it. So down here, we, um, we created our vector. It's called stuff. Great name. And we're going to call fill with stuff and then a lambda expression. And this lambda expression is capturing default by reference, and it's returning stuff, the size of stuff, greater than or equal to 8. <laughs> so if all goes well, within our fill, every time we go ahead and check whether or not we're done, we're going to go ahead and execute is stuff size greater than or equal to 8. And sure enough, it does. Yes? I could be misremembering this, but um, to leave off the return type of a lambda, um, can you also leave off the return keyword with that? I don't believe so. No? no. Return is always required? Return is required. Okay. Yeah, the section says that, um, we'll, we'll actually get to the word in a few more slides. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I have a question related to, uh, to the T done. Yes. Whether that should be a, a reference or not. Great question. Um, so it's not a reference. So what am I doing? By value. Copy. Yeah, by value. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm making a copy. And a little bit later, we'll talk about copies and what, what we actually get for free or is given to us out of our Lambda. Um, so our closure objects have some certain functions that are happen to be there. One of them, clearly, we can make copies. Why, here, so let's answer the question, why don't I have to copy, pass it by reference? Because the information about the code for that function is part of its type. Okay. Not only is it part of its type, but it's part of its type and the information is by reference. So we're going to copy a reference to stuff when we, when we go ahead and pass in our closure object. So indeed, we're going to pass our closure object by, by value. We're going to get a copy, but the copy contains a reference to, um, to stuff. Obviously, if our reference um, to stuff goes away, we're in trouble, right? Stuff goes out of scope, and we still have this lambda floating around with a reference to something that is out of scope, then it's undefined. All right, same idea, but um, let's do something a little more interesting this time. All right, again, we're going to capture by reference. And um, within here, we're going to go ahead and create a local variable called sum, initialize it to zero. And we're going to go ahead and have a for each. 
stuff. So we're going to iterate across stuff. And we're going to go ahead and add them all up. This capture is also by reference. And it's capturing sum. At the end, I'm going to check whether my sum is greater than or equal to 10. With any luck, every time this runs, it will go ahead and add up what we've got so far inside of our vector. And as soon as we're done, meaning that the sum of the elements within the vector are greater than or equal to 10, then, uh, then we're, we're done and we'll exit out. Of the and we get 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Does it capture stuff as well, though, the inner lambda? The inner lambda um, is not capturing stuff, and we'll talk about why. But in essence, um, we might talk about it now. The inner lambda is not using stuff. So there's no need to capture it. But if it, if it were, it would have. If it were, it would capture it. And we'll talk in a little bit about how it captures it and, and um, the different variations of that capture. Yes? Since you're using for each there. If I captured this return value, would that be my lambda at the end? The return value of for each? Yes. Okay, so I'm stumped. What is the return value of for each? I think it returns zero to the uh, front door. It returns you the front door. So oh, it says that out. Oh, is it? That makes sense. Okay. And that leads to my next That's a side question. slide coming up later also on something else, but. Well, then, then, then I'm wondering, um, you're bringing some in from outside. But could I do something evil like uh, inside lambda and say static int sum? Static int sum. It is have the have the int. Oh, within your lambda? Yeah, in the lambda because it's for each. I know I'm calling it once and I get it back at the end, and that's it. I say that because I'll do that with functors, for example. They do that for lambda. I I don't believe you can. But um, now I'm going to now I'm going to look around the room because all the smart people in the room are still right. <laughs> No, I don't, I don't believe you can do that. Okay. All right, any other questions on where we are so far? Could you ask about the static thing? Is lambda is technically equal to a linear function? It should behave inside the function. You're correct. And so, so um, now I have homework, and I gotta go find out. Yeah, it's not an A. It's <laughs> but, you get, but you get the return object back from the for each. Um, I was a real daring to type it in. But we're not going to. I think the question is, can you then access a variable quicker than that? It would surprise me if you did. Um, if you could? Yeah. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. because it's, def it, it's definition is visible. I don't know how, I don't know how you could. Well, you could return it. No, you're returning a closure object, which has, um, which we haven't talked about all that it has yet. But no, no, inside lambda, you could return it. But if you're just accumulating state inside lambda, you don't care about this. It's return type from point to point. You just care about it at the very end. So you can just call the lambda and get the sum out by it. So each time for each yeah. call it, we're ignoring the return right. value. This seems reasonable. Are you going to talk about Anybody have any other hard questions at this point? We're just going to roll them now. <laughs> all right. Um, let's go ahead and talk about capture default all by value instead. So we just looked at we can capture by reference. Now we can capture by value. Uh, so here we're capturing um, my mod by value. Where is the value actually captured at? So at what point do we capture um, v in this example? We're assigning v to 42. Um, we're using auto. We're creating um, our, our lambda expression will be evaluated. It'll create our closure object which is then being assigned to func. Then we're setting v to 8, and then we're going ahead and calling func. So what are we going to get? 
Love the smart graphs. Yeah, so obviously, if we're capturing by value, it's going to be captured at time um, of the evaluation. If we were wanting eight, if that's the behavior we wanted, then what would we do instead? All right. Um, so here we're capturing by value. Um, we're getting fancy now. We have no parameters. We're leaving them off. We're taking i and multiplying equal two, and we're returning i. And it does this amazing thing. It, comes back and it says that I is in a read-only object and I am trying to assign it something. What's going on, right? So closure objects have an inline function call operator that has a signature, the parameters that match the expression, the lambda expression, and the return type that matches the lambda expression and its const. And so we can't just go around um, doing this, which is really the behavior you want most of the time. When you capture something by value, you kind of want it to be that value. Um, but, but if you insist that it's not, you can go ahead and use mutable. Now we do whatever we want. So uh, we've captured i. We're returning i. So at this point, we'll go ahead and print out 2i, which is 20, but i, of course, is still 10 because we've captured by value. Any question? Yes? Are the open parentheses required if you use Google? Yes. Okay. If you have the return type, does that come before or after the um, The return type comes after the parent. Okay. Does that fix? Anybody know? Is it required to be after the parent? I don't normally have to do this in other sessions when I, you know, <laughs> do training. It's like they just believe me. I say with confidence. You know. <laughs> <laughs> return type always comes after parents. Yes. It's after mutable. Yeah. Thank you. There you go. Now you know. <laughs> yes. If you want, if you were a psycho, yes. you want to write out the auto. I assume there is a syntax under which you could write out the auto. I don't believe so. Um, now somebody could correct me on that, but I, I was unable to find it because that was my intent was to write it and then show auto is really cool, right? Um, yeah, that's, 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 it's uh, function uh, left bracket boy left print boy. I, 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 that's that's not, a cast. But that's not the same. Really? Because it, it'll capture that. But that's different. Okay. Uh, I mean, the question the question I is, <laughs> and so let me I, let me if I can remember exactly what the standard says. It won't get an exact quote, but it every closure object is a unique type. So I don't know where is STL, but I don't know, you know, you can probably tell me exactly what that means. But I mean, I think every closure object, or, or Howard, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it, I, my assumption is, is if I have this lambda expression, exactly the same lambda expression, twice, um, they're going to have two different unique types. So I don't know what they are. It means they get labeled two, two different names. Yeah. But they could be held by the function. Right. right. We'll get to that later. You guys are just so smart. You're trying to move ahead constantly. Yeah, I know I'm not clicking fast enough. Is that it? That's it. <laughs> All right. Um, Gorp. Um, I tried hard to get slushies into this presentation and slushy holders and things like that. And this almost made it, but not quite. But let me just tell you what the, the intent here is. We have this thing called GORP. And um, it's going to get initialized with some modulus. And it has this put where I can go ahead and put lots of information. Like I just got 13s of something and 12s of something. And 
Um, at the end, I want to go ahead and calculate what the extras are. So how many didn't fit in the crate, or how many didn't fit in the slushy holder? Um, and I, I got people within lots, so you know there'll be extras out of each lot, and um, they can't get mixed together again. What? So here we're capturing um, by value default all by value, but count we're capturing by reference. GORP within it has this vector of ints called values. It has m underscore, which is the modulus value. Um, as we go ahead and call put, we simply push back the new values. And extras then uses a for each, taking, of course, the value that's inside of the vector doing the modulus division of that value and whatever we had captured, um, and then adding them all up, and then we're going to return the value. So we create one of these with a modulus of 4, and we put in 3 and 7 and 8, right? And if everything works out right, we should get 6. Um, all right, so. Value, count is being captured by reference. Count's easy. We go ahead and we've initialized it to zero. We're going to use that to accumulate our result and return it. Um, but what's with, what's with m underscore? How in the world did we get m underscore? We captured this by value. The guy in the front row, we captured this by value. And so we have an implicit capture of this because we're using m underscore. And so now we can go ahead and treat anything that happened to be there as if um, it was within this local scope without using this. So m underscore is this. So Wait, let so. me ask you, in that case, in the context of that class, Yes. Is equivalent to say equal, I mean, capture everything by value than saying this? Is it equivalent to say equal or this? Um, you can, <coughs> we will get to the rules of what you can mix and match. You <coughs> cannot have equals and this. No, no, I wasn't meaning that. I wasn't meaning instead of putting equal, if yes. I change it. Yes, you could have this and then you could have count. In that case, would have been the same effect in the in the context of the class because the lambda is being defined in, in the context of the class GORP, right? Yes. So it would have been interchangeable. In it would have been identical. Okay. Yeah. okay. But you said implicit this capture, then you don't need an equal, right? That I was trying to. He's trying example. to make a new new example. I that I have a different question. Oh, my yeah, and that question is if you get this by implicitly. Did you truly, truly need the equal? Yes, you need the equal to capture by value, by the default by value. Um, M is what you're using, but M is not in our local scope. M comes about via this, and so the wording is that this is implicitly captured. If you okay. remove the equal, then it, all you're capturing is count. Yeah, yeah, if we remove the equal, we're only capturing count. Absolutely. And you would get a compiler error on M. And it's really cool because it's only like one line instead <laughs> of pages and pages of compiler error. Yeah. I really like it. Yeah, I was going to ask about this, but now it seems like uh, since you're using M underscore there, it's just pointing out that it must be the member of this that gets copied <coughs> passed by value. So I was going to ask whether values is going to be copied as well since you're passing this by value, but apparently not. So it's just the name resolution there. Um, so we don't make an extra copy of values. You, when you we should capture know. You this should by um, Right, you capture what you use. Yes. And so what we're actually using is this. And we're going to see that in a moment. Um, at least in an example that totally surprised me. It caused me to reread the standard probably like three or four more times until so I finally figured out. So. <laughs> But then, since you capture this by value, um, it's only const, it's const, right? As you said, mutable, so you can change. And we'll come back to your question. Uh, if you uh, 
would capture value uh, values by value and not use it. Do you know if it would actually make a copy? I do know, and you'll find out in like three more slides. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same question. Unless I can answer that for GCC. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, all right. So the question is, is now, will this compile? I have a struct foo. Um, it, it has a parameter i that's initialized to zero. Um, it, this incredibly amazing method that does nothing except for setting i equal to eight. Last line of failed compile. I'm sorry, it's a struct. <laughs> <laughs> I guess better have another cup of coffee. <laughs> You're good. I I Does anybody else have another opinion of whether it will or won't for a reason? Um, it should fail to compile because I is const because the lambda is not different. Okay, so that was my answer also, but this was the result. Mm -hmm. um, it's only this is const. Yeah. Right, so this <laughs> is const. And this sent me for, through tailspins for hours. Um, because to me, this is not obvious um, behavioral. Um, it, it was after I thought about it long enough. But um, this is being captured by value. It is constant. You're not changing this, though, are you? Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, f.i is actually a. Does that make sense to everybody? Or does it maybe not make sense? If we were dealing with a constant method, uh, it would not be able to assign i, because although i is not declared constant, it inherits constants from the constant list. Yeah. Okay, I'm not talking about the answers now. Okay, no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> between a pointer to const and a const pointer. So, yeah. And finally, a const pointer to const. <laughs> <laughs> right. So just read them backwards, right? So um, a const pointer, the pointer cannot be changed. Um, you know, this used to be my classic interview question until somebody leaked it out. Um, you know, what's the difference between const char star or char const star and char <coughs> char const star const, you know, and and then all the other comments. And um everybody gets it. So I just I'm hiring a better that's what um but yeah the pointer itself is const but not the thing it points to. That's the thing to do. Yeah so this um this did send me through a tailspin so obviously, if you make amazing a constant method, this will fail. If you make amazing a const method, that's a cool part. It will fail because it would have to modify the state. That is not true. It will still compile. No, it's not. Oh, it's amazing. Has captured the distance past. Amazing were a constant method, it would be passed a constant So, um, a constant pointer is a constant. Yes, yes. Right, a constant pointer. Which is why you probably don't compile. But, please don't compile. Just type a constant method. Yeah, somebody typing this in? <laughs> I said to bring your light lambda enable compiler. This is a good one. I typed it in plain. Plain doesn't like it. Plain doesn't Plain does not. Do you have GCC too, by the way? Just wondering. No, I don't. Okay, the only reason I asked is because I think I actually tried that last night. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yeah. I, I, I won't claim to say that Clang is right here. I do not know. This is too confusing. I will claim that Clang is right here. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> I, I trust, on so, this issue, I trust Doug. And yeah, I, I think you would have been very, very particular. I'm fairly, so that that's what I expected. Because um, I actually tried to make a slide last night to help clarify some of this. Um, and sadly, I'm in Windows because the USB to RGB thing only works there. But um, as soon as I reboot into Linux, I'll look and see whether it's compiled or not. All this code, I can give you guys the code that's in all the, the slides too. Or not to not to present without compiling in front of the boost card. Okay. Um, all right, so I have another outstanding question. The list is getting longer. This is actually why I'm videotaping so I can write my questions in there. Um, there are restrictions to the capture though. Um, and we mentioned a couple of them actually already. So first of all, identifiers can only be listed once. And of course you'd say, duh, who would not? But um, I can tell you one of the clients that I'm working for. We're, we're doing some, we think they're neat tricks, and um, they're generated code via some macros to make an interface that was very ugly, easy to use, and the actual solution was a bunch of lambdas that get generated and passed in as parameters, and end up not being so easy to make sure that certain things were true. Um, so, identifiers can only be listed as once. This is bad. Jesus twice. Default by value, um, explicit identifiers then have to be by reference. You can't capture default by value and then list um, by value. So the equals and the this, they don't go together. And then um, here we have the same type of problem. Does that make sense? And then the opposite. If you capture default by reference, then you must capture by value if you explicitly um, list an identifier in the identifier list. Um, what happens in the second case if you don't capture this explicitly? This is not captured by is not captured by reference. Okay. Was that the question? Yeah. Yeah. So this is captured either by value or um, explicitly listed in that capture list. Okay. Yeah. So I'm a little confused. Um, what exactly, when you say capture this, is it capturing the this pointer? By value. By value. So you're capturing everything by reference and one thing. Ah, yeah, okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Which is sort of the part you said earlier. Yeah. Right. But you don't, you don't specify the constants anyway. It's not a capture. <laughs> you know, like everything. You know, I thought this makes sense. And then you an hour and a half for Lambda. I had first set of slides I wrote. I had a lot of interaction. There, there's less of that. <laughs> GCC 47 says that foo i is read only when the actual meeting is constant. Thank you. Yay! Yay. And right. You can use a static. That, that kind of makes me feel better all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And you can use a static variable inside your lambda, but you can't access it from the outside. Right. It's local to the scope of the function, but it's not a class static. Correct. Thank you. Right, because you are you're defining the inline um, function call op um, function call operator, right? Not not on the object itself. But then you will be updated through multiple invocations. Yes, right. because it's the same One. lambda object. All right, so um, let's talk briefly at least about scope. Um, it, it's actually not as hard as it looked to me, at least initially. Um, captured entity must be defined or captured in the immediate and closing lambda expression or function. So if you just ignore this part of it at the moment, the enclosing lambda expression part, you already know all the other parts, right? You, you do this all the time. You use um, some variable as local because it's within, you know, the nested curly braces where you can use it. Um, so nothing surprising there. Um, it's trying to untangle what enclosing lambda expression might be, is the, the, the part that we'll probably just work on right now. 
All right, so um, all these things we should just expect to work, right? So um, I is assigned 8, J is assigned 2, we're capturing by value, default, and we go ahead and put out I divided by J. No problem at all because um, this was <coughs> in the scope of things that we can normally do, right? We do this all the time. This is not surprising. Um, all right, now we have a lambda function captured by value. Within the lambda, we have a j um, set to 2, and we have another lambda function that's capturing by value. Same thing, i divided by j. And then we're going to invoke m. Um, and then out here, f. So when we, when we do this, m, um, we would hope that we get um, 4. And um, when we invoke f, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> when we um, we have m, and here we're going to invoke m. We're going to then take this capture, this um, closure object, and um, it's being assigned to f. So when we invoke f, this is what we're going to do. Invoke m. We're going to get a divided by two. We get four. So here, what's occurred is. This outer lambda expression is capturing by value, and the inner one is also capturing by value, and it's trying to access i. And it's able to do that because the enclosing lambda expression captured by value. And so it looks, do I have an i? I don't have an i. But he captured by value. Does he have an i? He has an I. So now I is captured. <coughs> so is it captured twice? Well, um, I think this is a lot like you can only tell the, the speed of something or the position of something. Because the only way I would know was um, by trying to do something with I, and then for sure it's going to be captured. But I think, in, in essence, it's captured one time. Maybe the challenge is what, what could happen if in the inner lambda we said mutable, you know? So Can we, we said mut mutable. Oh, mutable. Yes. Um, and we try to change the value of it. You'll, you'll see in a minute. Mm -hmm. Could you clarify the rules as to like when you can leave off the return type? Um, yes, and yeah, no. two more slides. Okay. Interestingly, this scenario, at least with references, it was captured by reference, Visual Studio 2010. In sense claims that I is not defined, but then rather is I instead. Yes. <laughs> it's just, it, it, it gets a bit tricky for IntelliSense. We have a, a long list of things that IntelliSense doesn't like to provide with us. Yes. Yes. Didn't George is somewhere. George in this session? Oh, the guy with the hand back there, you can, you can go talk to him later. George and I had a long talk about IntelliSense and other things mismatching. He's our, he's our Microsoft taking notes guy. Look at that. <laughs> Any other questions at this point? OK. Um, so we're going to do a couple more of these. So uh, here we have a lambda that is capturing i by value, obviously. Um, everything else is the same. And so this should behave the same because i was captured by the containing lambda expression. So let's not capture it. And we get exactly what we would want, an incredible compiler error that points exactly to the line where the error is, and it tells me exactly what's wrong. i is not captured. So I captured nothing. i is not captured. Make sense? All right. All right, let's have some more fun. We're going to capture by value in our outer expression, but we're going to capture by reference in our inner expression. And, of course, this is not going to do what you wanted it to or you thought it might. Um, we're going to get an error which is assignment of read-only location 
Because here I'm trying to actually um, modify that same thing that we did a couple slides ago, right? I captured by value, things const. <coughs> so I can get wild with mutables again. And then I can do anything I want. So same thing, capture though this time and add mutables. So now I've captured i by value, but i is mutable. So we do something, and um, we now have modified i within our inner closure object when we, when we execute it. Um, and so i is some value, but we, we expect i to be unchanged, right, when we get out of here because we've captured by value. And sure enough, um, it, it does what we were hoping. No, we don't. Okay. It's so much fun now, let's really mix it up. So we have um, i, j, and k, which are 1, 2, and 3. We're going to capture i in the outer expression by value. j and k we're going to capture by reference. And then within our inner, we're going to capture i this time by reference, j by value, and k by reference. And so what we're trying to figure out is, what, what's the association here, right? What are these things going to do? So value, reference inside, reference, value inside, reference, reference. And after I capture them, I'm just going to reassign them to 4, 5, and 6, make everything mutable so it stops complaining. Inside, we're going to print out i, j, and k. And then um, when we go ahead on the outside, we'll print out i, j, and k. So, um, We've captured i by value, and um, here, the value by reference. So we would expect it to be 4. I or j, we've captured by reference. Here, we've captured it by value. So um, what's going to happen now when we assign it? Right, we're changing the local copy, but it's not going to be reflected, of course, right, in, in our outer. Um, and then k we've captured by reference, and then again by reference. And so we have um, the changes that we would expect to represent that from our inner and our outer. Is there a sharp crowd? All right, so closure objects have implicitly declared copy constructor and a destructor. So, um, most of you know just what that means immediately, but it's always fun to demonstrate it. So there's this simple little thing, struct called trace, does nothing more than prints out whether we're constructing, copy constructing, destroying, or assigning, um, and we throw an I in there just so that we can use it later. So, we construct our T, so we have an object, and we're capturing by value, and we're returning i divided by 2. i is a local, and we get construct and destroy, <coughs> because we've constructed and we've destroyed, so we construct t here and we destroy it when we leave our scope, but even though we've captured by value, we didn't use it in our statement, and so um, it's not there, right? Unless we use it, it doesn't actually get captured. But in this case, you don't you don't actually execute it. But it's by value, and so at the time of evaluation of the expression, the copy would have to be made. The expression is never evaluated. Oh, the expression is evaluated, and it's assigned to M. And I now have a closure object, M1. So I have a closure object, M1. This has been evaluated. You, you might get a I actually know it had to be evaluated because that's one of the rules 
or you can put random expressions. You might get a warning that it's an unused variable. I don't know. <laughs> because you're not calling me. I wanted one. <laughs> but I didn't get one. Um, yeah, so, um, because we don't use it, it's not captured. So let's go ahead and use it. Same type of thing. Um, I'm assigning a local i to the traces i. Uh, this will be evaluated. The closure object is assigned to m1. And then for fun, let's go ahead and make a copy of m1 and assign it to an m2. All right, so T gets constructed. Copy construct. Yep, that's what I expected, right? I captured by value, and I'm using it. So T's got to get copy constructed. Make copy. Copy construct again at the assignment, which is really an initialization. And then we destroy all three as we leave the scope. Yes? Pointy question, but what happens if you capture T explicitly but never use it? Instead of equal, you say T. Why does it do that? Howard? If we capture T but we didn't use T? Chandler, if we capture T? <laughs> <laughs> I strongly expect that will force a copy on the input. I, I think that the capture list is going to be interpreted explicitly, really? but I would need to spend a lot of time so, to be confident in that. For some reason I have in the back of my head that's actually an error. Um, but That's easier to check. A, a capture but not used, I think, is an error. So, so here in a minute, you guys get to do something. GCC does the and copy. I, what, what? GCC does the copy. I'm so glad you have a compiler. <laughs> if the rest of you would have brought compilers, you would have been better off. I, I, it's not an error. It makes a copy. It does what you would expect with the function. OK. Right? Like, it, it, it's. No, no, don't. That does what, it ex what you expect doesn't always work. <laughs> it's like a functor object. Yeah, yeah, right. The job yeah. passing into the constructor. Yeah, by passing into the constructor. Even if the constructor just drops it on the floor, you still pass it in by value to the constructor. Okay. And so you you are actually then getting a captured T or trace um, object with inside of the closure object. That that said, the the copy might be elided in certain circumstances, mm -hmm. but those, that would be rare, I think. Well, if the copy has side effects, then you you must copy. Not always. Okay. <laughs> Another hard question from over here. If you use ref, hard value reference. Lambdas don't have capture. You can't capture. I don't see how you can capture that. Yeah, lambdas don't have this yet. Yeah. Why the global object copy into M1 and not move? You can't use the object afterward anyway. Because that would have destroyed my example. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, I just wanted to show that things copy around and then we have a bunch of them destroyed. We have a move example for me. So we are saying that uh, just by capturing everything, it's going to make a copy of. Everything is open. No. no By, if you use the default, yes. it will only capture what's used, which is why in this previous example, we, we don't use T. So even though we capture default, yeah, because I'm not going to be disastrous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, that would make Lambda uh, um, unfortunately not useful. Yes. 
Oh, more questions? <coughs> All right. All right, so um, Eric unfortunately left just as we're getting to return types. So this is, this is the return type rule. Um, if you omit a return type and the statement has a return such as return expression, then the return type will be whatever the expression would evaluate to um, after all the normal things, right? Same normal things as always. L value to R value conversions, array to pointer conversions, function to pointer conversions. So it just does exactly what you expect. I, I personally think, you know, by the time we get to C24, it'll look a lot like all these other loosely typed languages. I just don't have to type things in anymore. <laughs> Yeah, otherwise the type is void. Yeah. I, I was under the impression that it was like the same rule as const expert, that you, you could only be one statement. You can have an arbitrary number of statements. Yeah, so you know, um, I don't know where that came from. Yeah. Um, it came from SDL's blog post. Oh. It, it doesn't appear to be true. I couldn't find it. I was on, I was under the exact same impression. So was I. Yes, I, it's very solidly. I'm really surprised right now. I was too. <laughs> what if you have multiple returns? Yeah. Can you? Do you get your UVK? Multiple returns? Or, I mean, multiple, yeah. like if you have an arbitrary if blah 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 return mm -hmm. this, you know. That, what if there are slightly different types? Oh, can it then determine? I, well, I don't think it would then match there. this, would it? Just you can. Well, if you declare it as returning int and then you have multiple returns, it won't work out. If you do that. No, I mean, if, if you define the type explicitly and then return different types in different spots, it right. it, it, then it does exactly what you expect, right? So any other function that you define return, you know, bar, and then as long as whatever you're returning, you convert to a bar. Does it doesn't it does 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 the standard says that the compound statement of the lambda must consist solely of a return statement. Okay. If you omit the return Where, type. Can you tell me what section it is, please? <coughs> Um, Are you actually looking at the standard? I'm actually looking okay. at the standard. The only reason I ask is because I, I looked for the same thing. It's paragraph four of the lambda section. Uh, if the compound statement is of the form, curly, attribute specifier sequence, return, expression, this, no, close curly. Thing, dot, 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 return, no, expression. No, it's not a dot, dot, dot. It's an attribute specifier sequence that is optional. Which is what? An attribute? Those are not statements. Those are, are generalized attributes. So squares, like... Like square bracket, square bracket. So that would indicate that none of this should work, right? But it does. No, so. it, it's void otherwise. Right. So and most. No, yeah, you, you had one just there with a. Yeah, so, with so two statements. That Here's one, one. No, that example. one should not compile. It does. I think he's wrong. You're saying it should not. Yes. I would have loved to try it on Clang, but my Clang doesn't. Like I'll, I'll, I will try this. But the standard doesn't seem ambiguous here. There may be a defect report. I haven't been following those for lambdas, but. Howard, do you know? I don't know, and I don't have to check the defect report in this direction. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, you know, I had also read STL's blog, of course. And so when all this stuff was suddenly working, I went and looked for. I do agree with Chandler's uh, interpretation of M3290. That's what I've got. Thank you, 90. Yeah, I, I don't see any, any basis for a compiler accepting your code. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the previous session, the guy just kept saying, and he's on the standards body, you know? Just try it. <laughs> Purposely not using names at the moment because it'd be recorded, but. <laughs> in, in Clang, uh, with first the set around and return, I. I uh, get warning, C11 requires lambda with omitted result type to consist of a single return statement. 
Yeah. A warning? A warning. Oh, an error. We, we probably implement this as an extension by default. Okay. I think so. Okay, so don't do what I'm doing, and if it's more than one, follow STL's blog and just give it the return tag. Sorry. Who wants to write portable code? Is that what you just said? Yeah. I'm, I'm checking on <laughs> <laughs> you. Thanks, <laughs> Um, all right, we did this, we did this. Oh. oh, it was over there already. All right, so, uh, here's a move. Does anybody know this reference, or was it just me? So, yeah. I'm, starting to, I'm starting to worry. It's appreciated. <laughs> it's part of it's depreciated? Yeah. Yeah, it, it didn't have a very good shelf life, that's for sure. How many know this? <laughs> All right, so those of you who know what this means, and if you want to go here and put in your name, you can get a shirt. Well, if you're, I'm going to have, a, I'm going to give away the lamp shirt like John has on, um, that has this code on it, um, to uh, five people each day. So, you know, if you go there and just enter your name, you don't have to put your email in. If you put your email in, we're going to open source, um, a JSON library and a YAML library coming up, as well as our distributed state machines are coming up. So the, the JSON and the Lama, um, the JSON and the YAML libraries are being released in the next month um, for open source, and we'll let you know. Um, all right, well, the rest of you don't know what it means, don't want to share it. Um, let's talk about story. So we've looked already, we've seen two different ways where we can have a type name of T, and we can go ahead and make assignments. The other is um, we have auto, which is wonderful. <clears throat> if the lambda expression has no capture, then it can be converted to a function pointer with the same signature. And since all of us love writing C-style function pointer type defs, I'm sure we'll be doing a lot of this. So, f-type, make the assignment, treat it like it's a function, and then call it. Lucky for us, that's not the only way to do it. And so, um, we have std function now, which, um, how many of you use boost function? Like everybody? So it's like almost the same thing, except um, not. So it's a polymorphic wrapper, again, for, for things that look and act like functions, right? So we can take function pointers, member function pointers, functors, which would also then include closure objects. Um, and it used the declarator syntax. So um, R is the return type. And then we have the args that will, will be passed in. So R is the return type of that function signature. And then the args that would be passed in for, for the function. Just for those who don't remember what we used to do, <laughs> All this ugly stuff now just looks the same all the time, which is brilliant. So, function to pointers. Function pointers. I have a function, I agree function, takes a string, turns size, here's my signature. I can just assign it. And then I could just call it. Member function pointers. Same type of thing. Here we have a struct. It has this method called size. I have a signature of it's going to return an int, take no arguments. I'm going to use bind. So I'm taking the address of the size method. Um, I, 
I've constructed a my struct here called mine. I'm using it by ref, so I don't want to copy the thing in. I actually want a reference to this thing, so I use ref. And then now I can just call um, f as normal. Functors. So I have my functor, here's my functor, mine, again, same <coughs> signature for our function, our std function. Um, and here I'm going to assign it by reference to f. Not going to make a copy. And then I'm just going to call f as if it's just some plain normal function. And then, of course, we can do the same thing with closure objects. So this will evaluate then to the closure object. It will be assigned to F. And then it, I can make the call. <coughs> We're all good with, uh, with the function? Yeah. All right, let's have fun with function then. So um, I have a function that takes an int, and it returns an int, and it's F1. I have another function, takes an int, returns an int, and I'm going to call that one f2, and I'm going to assign it the closure object after this lambda expression has been evaluated, which is going to capture by reference, it's going to take um, an integer as an argument. At this point, we learned what we should be doing is putting our return type here, I'm going to call all my slides, we're going to go ahead and put i out to the standard output. If i is greater than 5, then we're going to take two steps back and call f1. Yes? Isn't the compiler going to just like that if you're not returning on one foot path? Yeah, we just learned that. But this compiler that I'm using, it doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that this is a more ordinary case of you don't always have a return statement at all. You get a warning and you have no else as well. If you're looking at Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. So, um, I can tell you the GCC is. <laughs> no, um, no, I can. Wait, wait. It calls. Yeah. Okay, you're right. The typical thing when you don't return on a path is it's just an initial bit of data in their return. You don't use it anymore. Right. We're not going to, but it would have been nice to be told. Hmm. I don't know if a function a a a the function object, right? We're using this thing, so it's going to get captured, and it's going to get captured by reference. Uh, notice we haven't assigned it anything yet, but who cares, right? That's the whole point about capturing things by reference. So now we're going to assign it something, and um, we're going to assign it, again, something that takes by reference. I'm sorry, captures by reference, takes an int, outputs whatever was passed, and um, it's only going to take one step forward and call F2. So two steps back, one step forward. Um, you guys will do this every day of the week, except for this week, right? <laughs> and then we're going to call it with 10. And we're going to end up with um, what we expect. Our, um, we're calling F1 with 10. So we're going to output 10. We're going to increment it and call F2. And then we're going to output that, the 11, decrement, down 2, and all the way down to 5. So um, a neat trick is we can go ahead and capture by reference a function that is just an object, right, that's going to store something useful later and then utilize it. Um, this was supposed to be the amazing Y Combinator version, but I gave up. So instead, yes. we have um, 
a function that takes an int and returns an int, and we're just going to call that, that object back. We're going to assign it and capture back by reference. It then I'm going to compare, right, to is it zero, return one, else, return the value passed in times back minus one, which was a capture by reference of ourselves, but not yet, because this is the expression, remember, which will evaluate to a closure object that will then be assigned to the fact object, and voila, factorial of four. Now, could you just pause there for a couple of seconds? I certainly can. <laughs> yeah, this is a great place for you to pause. I don't know why you'd want to do this in real life, but it's fun on slide. <laughs> If I was happy to compile to give you the right output, right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I about that. All right, so everybody see what this is doing? So, so remember, this is, this is nothing more than a type, right? So this is just an instance of that type, and we're capturing that by reference so we can use it. And when we, by the time we use it, it's now been assigned something cool, our closure object, as opposed to what it was when we first started evaluating it. When we first started evaluating it, it's nothing, right? If we, if we, um, if we could call it at this point, which we can't, we throw a nice exception. But so by the time we actually use it, it has something useful assigned to it, because we call factorial all the time. All right. Now it's your turn because you guys are supposed to bring compilers. Half till four, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Ready, set, go. I want a class that can queue up callable things. Things is a technical term. The callable thing takes an int as an argument. The callable thing returns an int. The class itself is going to have a method that looks like this. Run, that's given an int as a parameter and returns some int. When run is called, each of the, um, each of the queued items will be called. The first queued item will be called with init as its initial state. The result then of that will be passed to the next item in the queue until there's nothing left, and then you return the final value. Um, we'll see people type it. Return the final value. It's okay, we won't have to type it, we don't want to. We've only got 10 minutes in. Um, all right, so let's do that. Wait, does everybody understand what we're trying to achieve? All right, we'll just skip to the end. Wow, you guys did an amazing job. What's that? You're going to go? You're going to do it? Jeff's doing it. Sure. Others join Jeff. This is where you break up your compiler. Really? There's two people. This guy down here needs to do it. What's his name tag say? He might get a shirt just because. Dan, Dan, man, all right. The rest of you are doing it in your head, I know that. It's okay. showing code to this group, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's okay, but you know what you could have done? Yeah. <laughs> no, Michael, the worst part is when you show code to them and they say, 
yeah, but that's wrong. You should do it this way. <laughs> and, yep. you, and all you can say is, yeah. <laughs> I tried so hard, too, to get the return value of the lambda expression. Just hurt me. Are you winning, Dan? Do you have a plan? That's okay. You can file it in your head. I'm good with that. Give an idea. Blackboard here. Blackboard. Yeah, we can just type on Blackboard. <laughs> you got an idea of where you're going with it, Jeff? Yeah. All right. So while the rest of them are working really hard, I'll show you. Um, yes. So by the way, I I <laughs> consulted with another person who's actually on core, uh, yes. Richard Smith. There is a defect report about the the lambda return type, okay. um, and it is essentially going to change the working draft to actually allow um, what the code you have to work. Really. Yes. <laughs> I almost feel vindicated, but it's for the wrong reason. So I don't know that I do. The, the rules are the, there's some interesting rules that are going to be introduced. So, for example, you will not be able to have a deduced return type if the return if any of the return statements use an initializer list. Okay. Um, but but, but that's already. <coughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's just it, it's a, it's kind of strange that that one doesn't work. Um. But then all of the expressions and all of the return statements have to all, after decay, um, have the same type, and then that's the re deduced return type. Okay, so if they all have the same type after decay, yes. that's the return type. Yes. And if they differ, then clearly you... If they differ, it's ill-formed. Um, if, if there exists any return without an expression, then it's void, and all of the returns with expressions, the expressions have to have uh, the, the type void. All right, wonderful. Thank you. It took a little bit of doing, but. It does what Doug wanted. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and move on. This now, um, I I did it the same way in the sense that I actually wrote this. And then I tried as fast as I can just to write code. That's another way of saying this code's probably really bad, but I'm going to show it to you anyhow. So this is what I came up with. Um, I called my struct machine, um, and my add is going to go ahead and take um, whatever's being added as a template type. And then I'm going to push it back. And we're going to come back here to, in just a second. I'm going to go ahead and push that back onto this vector. And the vector contains functions with a signature of returning an int and taking an int. Since you're storing it in a function object anyway, why wouldn't you simply accept the function object as the parameter to add? Um, I'll answer that now. So this will allow it to convert probably the other way too, but I like this because it works for my example. This then, um, type T, as long as it's compatible with this signature, um, will go ahead and work, right? So you get promotions. It, you're right, it is a case, but you know, I, um, this, is, this is a boostish type event, so we have to write the word template and type name, <laughs> <laughs> and yours didn't. <laughs> so that was my first one until I remembered where I was, and then I changed it, so. That's pretty funny. If you look in the GitHub, you'll see the other version first. <laughs> um, all right, and so then in run, oh, yeah. Um, and then run, I'm just going to use a for each. 
And I'm going to go through the vector. And it's taking then, of course, that function object. It's going to call the function object with the value that was passed in. <coughs> I happened to do it this way, but there was no reason for it, right? I decided that I was going to capture V, in essence, by reference. So I make the assignment back to V, and I return V. So by the end, I'm going to get the final value of V um, returned back out of my run. It's going to go through whatever happens to be in that vector, all the different callable things that take ints and return ints, and the final result will get returned from run. Um, so I made a foo free function here, um, just so we can have some more fun. We go ahead and add a closure object with this lambda expression. So we're going to multiply whatever i is by 3. We're going to go ahead and add foo. This foo thing just added 4. And then we have another where we're going to divide by 5. I run it passing 7. Does this make sense? So um, conversions happen the way you would expect conversions to. Um, so this standard function, if the signature can be, if you can convert from the signature you have to that signature, everything's great. <laughs> Apparently I don't, but I actually like it. Um, visually, when I look at that and I see the two, I know that's not everybody, but when I see the two stuck next to each other, um, I don't know. It looks like something else to me. Okay. I'm a white space fan. I know this is uh, talk on Lambda, but wouldn't a range 4 actually be No, but this is a talk on Lambda. <laughs> it's much prettier. There were lots of other things, too, with initializing over here, too. And then nobody brought it up. <laughs> Would you want to step stood forward, F? Does, does that make sense? Where? I'm sorry. The, if you, uh, could you could you have a move enable version for the for the? Sure, you can have you could have all kinds of fun things. All right, so let's talk about a, little, a few use cases for Lambda. We have just a few minutes left, which is great because I have to slide. Um, first of all, so where can you use Lambdas? It's easier to talk about where you can't use Lambdas. Lambda expressions have to be somewhere where they're evaluated. So they cannot appear in an unevaluated operand. And I love the standard. An unevaluated operand is something that does not get evaluated. That's neat. Um, so these, as far as I know, these are the ones <coughs> that are unevaluated operands. Mr. Smarty in the back can maybe help me here. But as far as I know, this is it. They can't appear with type ID, size of, no accept, and decal type. Beyond that, you can stick them anywhere you want. All right. This is what I think you should do. So this guy, you know, Stepanov is a sad man. He loves algorithms, and he, you know, algorithms are awesome. And then what do we end up doing is, or at least most of my clients end up using all the containers and never ever look at the algorithm. There's a four each. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's all these other really cool algorithms that do stuff, right? And so um, earlier, I was glad Jeff threw up that slide, the multiple, multiple, multiple <laughs> slides of all of these algorithms. And for myself, part of the reason that I, I don't use a lot of them is because they often require setup somewhere um, that will eventually get passed in, but it's so far away from the code that I want to use that it's just, at, at the end of the day, people are hunting around trying to figure out what you're doing. Um, and so I, I think that's a turnoff for a lot of people in using them. But you don't have that excuse anymore, right? So you're gonna have to come up with a new one. So just go through and revisit all of the, the standard algorithms and look, which of these would work great with lambdas? That's like, that's like homework. All right, so. Standard algorithms, callbacks um, would be a great place that you could use them. Runtime policies, right? Somewhere we kind of did that with the, am I done yet or not? Places where you pass stuff in at runtime to make conditions and make changes and decisions about what you're doing. Um, 
locality, obviously, of expression. I wrote this one down while I was on the plane, and then after I wrote the slide, you'll see why. It's a really crummy idea. Um, it's like bind, but not. <laughs> so here's my bind example. Um, all right, so here's this thing. It's a free function called bar. Take a string and an int, and it returns the int and the size of whatever the string is. Um, Profit <laughs> item socks, of course. Foo, if we wanted to call foo, which takes something or another, and a money maker, though I didn't put it up here, is expecting an int. Um, what, what I would have to do is bind this somehow so that I can get called with the int. So I bind in the profit item, and then a placeholder, right, for when I call it. And um, then eventually here, I'm going to call f, which is going to be this uh, bound functor that takes a single argument, the placeholder. Um, and we end up with this thing, right? Eight times the size of socks is my profit. Um, but I could have done this instead, right? Capture profit item by value. I'm going to have a signature where it takes an int, and I'm going to return, let's just call it bar profit item m. A lot of people I work with can't read this, and I'm pretty certain some of them will be able to read this, so this would be cool. Except that you can't do currying, so then all kinds of bad ideas start popping up. So then this is where I decided that instead, I want to know how you guys are going to use lambdas. What do you think? While you're thinking, I'll tell you another thing. I, um, initially, I thought lamb, I, my main use of lambdas would be just small little functions that I use for bits and pieces and whatever. And, um, and I don't actually know what it was. Something as I was reading through the standard made me think, you know, um, I, I use other languages that have lambdas, right? Unnamed functions. I mean, if you use JavaScript, oh. <laughs> Not very good. All right, well, whatever. I have, but if I'm you were to do that in JavaScript, then you never, you, you don't write like little one line lambda things. You write like pages of stuff that eventually becomes some lambda function that gets passed around. Just like unnamed functions are all over the place. Why? Because that's the way the language partially started off, right? And you just get used to doing it. Um, and so now we have this powerful thing. Um, who knows? I, I've heard a couple people say um, that, you know, that I expect these only to be small little snippets of stuff. They may not be small, but no. I personally don't know. So gonna have How are you going to use a Jets? <laughs> that would be so cool. Uh, well, okay, so certainly current you can't do, right? So I, I don't have the ability to have placeholders and I can't call I can't call this with five values when I really only want one. The signature says it's gonna take an int, I can't just call it with five ends. Bind is great, right? I get this object back. The signature was it's gonna take an int, this previous thing, right? Um <coughs> When I call this, if I want to pass it 20 ints, whatever. If I want to pass it whatever, it, does, it just doesn't matter, right? As long as placeholder 1 matches what I need, that's, that's awesome. Now, buying, buying's crazy powerful. But um, when you say you kind of do querying, are you saying your second call to wouldn't work, or just the actual ones? I'm saying that I, I can't have. Um, I can't call it with a different amount of arguments than the signature that's set up at. I should have used maybe a different one. I know I can't use that. Good. 
What do you mean by that? Um, yeah, just uh, in band, come out. One. Down here? Oh no, you just because you not, not have the man, body there. If you are the platinum, make an auto and then reuse it. Um, if, you, if you are the platinum lab outside and reuse it multiple times. Right. No. Fairly certain that's not allowed. Default values on parameters. All right, well, this is officially the end of the session. Um, is there any following questions or follow-up questions? Yeah. Why, why would you use Linus? Pardon me? Why would you use Linus? Yeah, so some, some of the things, for example, before each, right? It's, it's so much easier in our first example to um, iterate over a container using for each. Everything's right there. And you're going to perform some tasks on everything there. And you can just write it as a lambda, so it's local. Otherwise, um, something has to get called to operate on each element within the container. And so you'd have to define that somewhere else, um, not where you're using it. And so the locality is a big issue, for, especially for maintenance. But um, unnamed function objects, just like we use function objects all the time, but now we can define them right in line. Um, so, there, so um, my understanding is now, this is just from reading, it might have been STLs, that lambdas will um, will perform better than the same exact function object you might define above as a struct. But what about, you know, I mean, I mean, that's a, that same question. You started by defining a while loop, you remember, yeah. without if, returning to functions. Is a lambda going to perform better than the original loop you have when you started by assigning, you know, the beginning, the first iterator, the beginning yes. iterator? Yes. Yeah. The for each is just going to perform better. Okay. Yes. And what about the primitive why? You know, and your can you go back to the first? I can. Yeah. If you guys want to go there, the slides are there. Okay. You have, you know, you are started by assigning, you know, the beginning iterator, and you were iterating while the iterator was not the end, end one. So I guess that was the first slide. Oh, that was, oh, way back there. There. Yes. You know? So, is a lambda going to perform better than the body of the while? Yes. Uh, and and the reason just the, the reason I say this is because for each with a functor performs better than this. Okay. okay. Somebody who's real smart here and about why the compiler can optimize that better can tell why. I don't know. Can you repeat the question? It, um, <coughs> Why, for example, the Lambda version, why the Lambda version with for each performs better than the while loop? Uh, I don't believe that's true. You don't? No. I'm happy to like, like argue about optimizations, but I don't believe that it's actually true. The only reason it might be true is if you have a, for, if you have a loop, um, you may have dependents within the loop that the compiler can't prove don't exist. Um, so one thing that lambdas and, and the 4-H sometimes help with is proving that in fact the, the, the iteration, like the trip count of the loop right. doesn't depend on the operations within the loop, right. but that doesn't always pan out and mm, compilers are really good at proving this for normal loops. I wouldn't expect them to be to perform differently. I would consider it a bug if they did. Right, so the smart guy with the compilers in the back says smart real compilers that you should be using on a daily basis should do that. Mind you, I can only really speak for LLVM here and Clang, but I would I would be shocked if LLVM and Clang compiled this loop into slower code than any code involving a lambda, and we actually might do a, a worse job with the lambda. A worse job with the lambda? Yeah. So to summarize, Chandler, you said the lambda will the lambda version of this code will perform better than the primitive while. Or no, I no. The other way around. I'm saying that the. the Given this exact code, right, um, I would not expect there to be any difference in theory. In practice, lambdas are newer, and we have less experience optimizing them, so we may have missing optimizations with lambdas. Okay, okay, okay. 
it, it, it like if you take the limit over time as we learn all of those tricks, I would expect the two to produce identical code. So it's just a matter of time that someday we may discover a way, or is the fact that here you are not calling any function? You're not calling any external functions, you're not writing to memory which might alias some other memory. There's no, there's never going to be a problem analyzing this loop. The best you're ever going to get is a lambda to equal that loop's performance. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we've got these, uh, uh, these computer libraries, Phoenix and Lambda and Boost. I was wondering, with the introduction of this into the standard, where do you see, has the role of those libraries changed? Um, I can only, I just give you my personal opinion, right? And, and Joel de Guzman and I we'll talk a lot. Um, so first of all, uh, Phoenix should be replacing Lambda anyhow, right? So, so if you're using Lambda, so you just should not Boost Lambda, you should already be on Phoenix. Um, the advantage I see what, when I need it of Boost Phoenix is it's polymorphic, which we saw early on in one of these slides. Um, this one in particular. This Phoenix function of total elements multiply equal some placeholder doesn't care about the type. It will determine the type when I call it and use it. And I can't do that with a lambda, right? I actually have to say, it has this type of uh, parameter for the inputs and the outputs, and um, yeah. What's Chandler's uh, take on performance uh, with this one? Oh, he's gone. He's left. He's smart. <laughs> I find that in, in real life, and this is why I'm really excited about lambdas, yeah. is that I, I never have something that, so sure. I've got um, accessing members, of, of classes that require more functions to be right. and call them functions, right. another bind, right. and I kind of just get buried in, in these binds and things, and I forget to call ref once, right. and everything just blows up. And so lambdas are just so exciting because I, it just makes these things, I can write it the way it's supposed to be. Right. I completely agree. And, and then if you do it wrong with the current libraries that we have, I mean, it's just Ooh. more of what the output is, is a disaster. Maybe I can say that <coughs> uh, in, when we deal with parallelism on different kind of strategy of partition that um, use uh, Africa and like expression are very useful so that user focus on their codes and we can provide them different way of parallelizing the data and uh, call the data with different kind of distribution. Right. So we have us, us, different kind of for each, mm -hmm. for each with different strategy. But we, we can have lambda function very complicated, but we just focus on, the, on what to do on each data. Right. And we don't focus on, on the for each, right. we, which can be different regarding the hardware or the, the way you want to, to parallelize data. Right. So, great. Yeah. Thank so, you. That's a great example of parallelism where, where that loop is magic. Yeah, and something's going to happen, right? We don't care bomb. about the loop. We just right. want just what is the thing I'm trying to perform? Yeah. Good point. And we can have lambda function very complicated, big, big uh, lambda function. But uh, people uh, just see it uh, as a, a function, uh, a real complicated function. We know. But they, they, they know that this function is apply on each set of the collection. And uh, the way it's part is okay. All right, so we're, we're now over, and um, I can't get internet here on my laptop, but I can get on the tablet. So the names that came up, top five were Marshall, James McNeil, uh, McNeilis? McNeilis, thank you, Andy Weber, Kyle, NY something, <laughs> better than butchering it, right? Pat Knotts. So if you're one of those people, if you want to come up, I have like three sizes and I'll give you a shirt. You can get your very own lambda tea.